And we're back. And our first concept back is a brand new <coughs> concept, which is why that was a really good stopping point. It is the respiratory membrane. So when we say met respiratory membrane, what we mean is that you have the space in the alveolus where you're going to have air. You're going to have the simple squamous alveola, uh, alveolar cell. That's your type 1 alveolar cell. You're going to have a shared basement membrane. Then you're going to have the capillary endothelium cell, which will also be simple squamous cell. Here's the nucleus of that cell. Then you'll have plasma on this side of the membrane, and you'll have a red blood cell, and that oxygen molecule is also going to have to go into the red blood cell to be transported. So basically what we're saying here is, even though we've got the thinnest cells we can possibly physically have, they still have to go through plasma membrane, plasma membrane, basement membrane, plasma membrane, plasma membrane. That's your respiratory membrane. That's still a lot of membranes to go through, right? So we have this concept here, diffusion rate is inversely related to diffusion distance. If you don't like the mathematical concept there, then just don't use it. All it means is the farther you have to go, the slower you're going to get there. That's all we're saying with that. So if this was thickened for some reason, if there was something going on, maybe you have some mucus here, or maybe you have some inflammation, and that's increasing the size of the respiratory membrane, what would happen to diffusion rate? It would be slower. It would decrease. So that's all you have to really understand there, is the membranes we're going across and how diffusion rate relates to diffusion distance. Just like running a mile is, takes a lot longer than running 10 feet. That's really all we're getting at. This is your image from your textbook that's very, very high quality. This would be an ideal one for me to test you on the respiratory membrane as a whole, the alveolar type 1 cells. So each of these portrayed divided by a line here. Each of these is a type out 1 alveolar cell. There's a nucleus there. There's a nucleus there. These are all type 1 alveolar cells that make up the structure of that sort of spherical, semi-spherical alveolus. And the type 2 alveolar cells are these ones, uh, let's see, right here, that look like they have these little cellular projections. These are the type 2s that are producing surfactant. So this would be a good place for me to test you on that. You can see the capillary bed embedded in here, gazuntite. And you can also see the alveolar macrophages, or dust cells, portrayed in this image. And again, over here, gazuntite. We have the portrayal of the respiratory membrane with the capillary and or sorry, capillary endothelial cell over here, the respiratory alveolar cell, type 1 alveolar cell here, and their fused basement membrane in between. Feel good about that image? You understand that image visually? Sometimes people do get caught off, uh, caught up here because this is sort of a cross section, right? They've taken a cross-section of the alveolus, and they're sort of looking down on the cross-section they made in three dimensions. So I do rec recommend spending some time making sure that visually makes sense to you. Yes? Is the ratio of type 1 and type 2 um, cells the same? Like, is there always going to be one type 1 cell for one type 2 cell? I don't know that it's one-to-one. -one. I don't know what the ratio is specifically. Back at the macroscopic view, back in gross anatomy, we zoom out, and just like with every body cavity, you are going to have pleural membranes surrounding this organ. Same thing we're going to see in the digestive system. You're going to have pleural membranes there as well. And you've known this from a, since AMP1. What do we tell, say that membrane, or, or sorry, I gave you pleural membrane, uh, serous membranes overall. Uh, you'll see serous membranes in various body cavities. Uh, and I already gave it away, but what are we going to call a serous membrane that surrounds the lungs? It's right up there. You can just read it. Pleura. There you go. So you're going to have a visceral and parietal pleura. Where is your parietal pleura going to be? Outside. Outside, body wall. And the visceral pleura is going to be? Adhered to the surface of the organ itself. And then, of course, you're going to have a cavity in between those two serous membranes. That's going to be the pleural cavity. 
and that should be a very small space and it should be filled with a little bit of fluid. Serous fluid should be in that space. We don't want too much fluid, that's going to be bad. We don't want air, that's going to be bad. We just want it to be a very narrow space filled with serous fluid. And what's the purpose of that? Reduce friction. As you inhale and you exhale all day, every day, we want to reduce the friction of that organ rubbing on that body wall. Great. So some anatomy here, superior, middle, and inferior lobe on the right lung. On the left, again, there's only two lobes, the superior and inferior. So the difference is that middle. Make sure you say middle and not medial. You also have the apex of the lung, and that's the superior surface of the lung. You have the base of your lung, therefore, down here towards that respiratory diaphragm surface, or diaphragmatic surface is another way to say that. This is a medial view. So this is a medial view of the left lung, which means this person is facing in this direction, and this is a medial view of the right lung, which means this person is facing this way. And I think we've already come to the concept of the hilum, right? So here's the hilum of each lung. And note that you've got a pulmonary artery in blue, and you've got a pulm two pulmonary veins in red. That should look familiar. Where's that coming from? The heart. Those are great vessels of the heart. So remember, this, these are medial views. Your heart's right in the middle here. Those are the exact same pulmonary artery from that pulmonary trunk and those pulmonary veins to the left atrium, right? They're just cut off closer to the lung, or closer to the lungs in this case. So the same ones, which means you could reason out the locations of each because you know your pulmonary trunk is going to be superficial, or sorry, superior. Your pulmonary arteries are superior to your pulmonary veins. <coughs> And then because your trachea is going to come in posterior to those, then those main bronchi are going to be posterior to each of the vessels. So I do want you to know the lo general locations of each of those. Pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, main bronchi. Pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, main bronchi. Sound good? Additionally, in this image, you have the diaphragmatic surface. Uh, some fissures that I didn't mention, horizontal fissure, oblique fissure, and since this only has two, it only has an oblique fissure. You can also see the lingula right here. Now it can be confusing for people putting an arrow for the lingula versus the cardiac notch. What that cardiac notch is actually pointing at is that deeper surface. So this is the lingula, this is the cardiac notch. Lingula, cardiac notch. So if I have to test you on that, but with just an arrow pointing right here, and you're not sure if I'm pointing at a lingula or a cardiac notch, look at the prompter, because I would say something like medial surface or deeper surface or concave surface, something like that to make sure that you could tell I was pointing back here rather than at this, or at this rather than back here. Does so anybody want to pass that around? Show yourself the cardiac notch versus the lingula. We'll see lingulas in our dissection today. The fetal pigs have a pretty decent lingula. It's not exactly anatomically the same as the human lingula, but they definitely have a little flappy bit of their lung that covers part of that heart. Uh, let's see, cardiac notch, cardiac impression, oblique, doo -doo -doo. I think we're good, horizontal fissures, yeah, we're good there. Great. Do you have to know the actual difference between the cardiac impression and the notch? I thought the notch was the concave part. You know what, I think the notch is the concave part too. I think they're calling it this little space right here. I'm going to look that up elsewhere, because I just noticed that too. Uh, fun fact, if you stab somebody from up here, you can hit the apex of the lung from there. It's actually a very high. 
Yeah, so on this, on the next slide, the 2511 it looks like the cardiac notch is just, it's just that shape. The yeah. Is the actual word. You're probably right. Um, I've always considered it to be that surface, but we can rethink that, absolutely. I don't think I'm going to test you on bronchial pulmonary segments. That is not really a thing I care about all that much. Um, it's worth noting that those bronchi actually do split in predictable common ways. I'm sure there's individual variation, but in general, you will have specific bronchi that serve these specific areas. That concept does come into play later on. So you can have a partial collapse of a lung. So it could be that just that apico-posterior portion of your lung collapses. It's called atelectasis, and that can absolutely happen. So they are in some ways isolated. It's served very specifically by uh, tertiary bronchus, again, which would be the same as a segmental bronchus. Uh, and pulmonary arteries are going to, to follow actually those airways very consistently. It's actually not true for veins, but your textbook says it's true for veins. We're just going to roll with it. So that's something we can try to look for in our fetal pig dissection today. If you want to spend a little bit more time there, we can actually look for, okay, here's the bronchus, and then there should be a blood vessel, and there should also be a vein more or less following that structure. They travel together in a tree. You guys are familiar with the pulmonary circuit from the heart. Right? You know that you have the um, pulmonary arteries that go to the lungs to get oxygenated and bring oxygenated blood back to the heart via the pulmonary veins. That's something you're already familiar with. Now what you may not be familiar with is that the lungs, even though they're inhaling air, those tissues are not automatically oxygenated from the air we get. And furthermore, as we breathe normally, we are not completely filling our, airs, our lungs with air all of the time. So we also have bronchial circulation in addition to pulmonary circulation. So your lung tissue does have its own supply of oxygenated blood in addition to the pulmonary circulation where gas exchange is occurring. Does that make sense? So there's a difference between pulmonary circulation and bronchial circulation. We're going to oxygenate the lung tissue, even though the job of that lung is to oxygenate things. It doesn't matter. We're not, we don't always have oxygen at every layer of our lungs. The tissue is too thick for that oxygen to simply diffuse to it, so it needs its own blood supply. There's quite a lot of lymphatic drainage around the lungs. In fact, uh, in my cadaver lab, we saw all kinds of black, gross um, lymph nodes right around that carina, right along that bronchial tree. That's actually one of the most obvious things. So we could tell if somebody lived in the city or not, or if they were a smoker or not, based on the color of their lymph nodes around here. Even if you just live in the city, these turn black over your lifetime. So that's fun. This is a physics concept, but it's an easy physics concept. So don't worry too much about it just because it has the word physics attached to it. This is Boyle's Law. And if you're comfortable with gradients, then you're already comfortable with Boyle's Law. All Boyle's Law is, is there is such a thing as a pressure gradient. So you have an amount of gas in a space. If you put pressure on that gas in that limited space, it wants to leave that space. If it has access to a space that has lower pressure, it's going to go there. Sound good to everyone? So areas of high pressure, gas under high pressure, wants to go to areas of low pressure. That's it. This is how inhalation and then exhalation happen. This is how episodes of ventilation occur. And just to review for people who showed up late, ventilation is going to be different from respiration today. 
here in anatomy class. It's different from respiration. Respiration is gas exchange. Ventilation is the mechanical inhalation and exhalation. Those are different concepts in here. So as we inhale, we contract our respiratory diaphragm muscle. That's our primary muscle of breathing. As we contract that, we increase the amount of space in the thoracic cavity. So specifically, that's increasing the superior to inferior dimensions of the thoracic cavity when we contract it. So it goes from a dome, passive dome shape, contracts into a flat shape, and that increases those dimensions. That means you have the same amount of gas under in more area, which means it's under less pressure. So this is now going to be an area of low atmospheric pressure compared to the outside environment. So now the outside environment is, has more pressure than the inside environment. Therefore, air moves down its pressure gradient into the lungs. That is how inspiration happens. Now during exhalation, for the respiratory diaphragm, that's actually passive relaxation. It relaxes back up into a dome shape, and that puts pressure on the thoracic cavity. Now you have that same volume of air under more pressure, increasing the pressure inside of the lungs, decreasing the pressure outside of the lungs, so air goes out, down its pressure gradient again. And that's it. Uh, it's not that difficult of a concept, but honestly, if you go ask a high school student how this works, they'll go, bam, bam. Uh, it's, it's seems really intuitive as I'm explaining it, but people are imagining like some kind of vacuum cleaner suction like with an at ex like with an output somewhere. Yeah, I've, I've talked to high schoolers about this. It's, it's not a good game. Uh, so that's the reason we have Boyle's Law. That's why we take this big complicated physics approach to say we inhale air goes in, we exhale air goes out, right? So does that pre do the pressure gradients make sense to you guys? Boyle's Law makes sense? Okay. So the respiratory diaphragm increased the thoracic volume in the superior to inferior direction and that actually pr puts pressure on the abdominal cavity so natural slow day-to-day -day breathing should move the abdominal cavity more than the thoracic cavity if you're not stressed breathing if you're breathing in a healthy normal way the hand on my abdomen should move as i breathe and not the hand on my chest this is actually something they teach you in like vocal training, for example. So breathing should look like that. If it looks like this, something's gone wrong. As in, if it looks like that when they're relaxed and sitting down. Now when we do go for a run, when we need to increase the volume that we are inhaling and exhaling, the volume of air that we are ventilating, the amount of oxygen we're getting, we'll start to use some of our accessory muscles of breathing, some of our skeletal muscles of breathing such as your intercostal muscles or some of your serratus muscles. Uh, in some cases, even your scalenes. So has anybody ever gone on a really long run and you end up with a really tight neck because you've been kind of like going like this the whole time? Part of that is the stress of breathing because those will help lift your thoracic cage. And when you lift your thoracic cage, we compare it to the arm of a bucket. So literally, there's our, there's our bucket pail comparison coming up. So normally, your costals are down here. If you have accessory muscles of breathing, skeletal muscles of breathing working, they raise up like this. And they expand the dimensions in the anterior to posterior dimension. So we're using a lot of terminology to describe something very, very simple, right? But you still need to know that terminology. That's, that's all jazz hands terminology for anterior, posterior, uh, dimensions increasing, thoracic volume, uh, which muscles do that, which muscles increase the superior to inferior dimensions of breathing. That's your respiratory diaphragm. So here are your skeletal muscles involved with breathing, and they should all look pretty familiar. I emphasize intercostals, scalenes, because of that pain issue that can happen. Um, some of your serratus posterior muscles, those are the ones I really care about. Yeah, the rest of those will be involved. It's, they're not as significant, in my opinion.
Any questions about that? Serratus? Yeah, those ones. Um, do we not, what do we use this for normally? Oh, they're definitely involved in breathing. Um, let's take a look at those serratus muscles. They're probably related to posture a little bit. One reason I care about these for respiratory accessory muscles, in particular from this crazy long list, is that once upon a time I had bronchitis for like a month, and these were in extraordinary amounts of pain. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Um, so it was definitely these serratus muscles that were being stressed while it was coughing constantly. Oh, yeah, no, I've had that kind yeah. of pain, like, when I run. Like, mm -hmm. if I haven't run in a long time. But, so I was just, like, what we use them for normally? Cause yeah, respiratory, um, it looks like they would have some action with some twisting motion. Um, maybe a little bit postural. Yeah, could look into it, too. Do you have any insight into that, male MT? What's that? Yeah, lots of tiny little movements, I imagine. Yeah, I imagine bilaterally it would help with posture. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, this is what massage therapists do. We look at it and we're like, what's it doing? <laughs> yeah, they're pretty rough. Oh, God, it was so bad. So bad. Okay, um, again, there's math on the next page, but we can just turn it into plain language. You don't have to care about that formula. So we have to talk about ventilation and things that increase or decrease flow. Airway resistance is going to be mainly about the diameter, right? We have bronchodilation, we have bronchoconstriction, and it's very, very much like blood flow, right? If you have more space for, in that case, blood, in this case, air to flow, is that going to increase airflow or is that going to decrease airflow? More space for it. Increase. And if we tighten up our bronchi, is that going to increase flow or decrease flow? Decrease. Decreases flow. Good. So all this says is flow is related to the change in pressure divided by resistance, and if you really hate math, and I know some of you do, that means that if resistance increases, flow decreases, and if the change in pressure changes a lot, the flow changes a lot. So this is a direct relationship between flow and pressure change, and an a opposite relationship between flow and resistance. Resistance increases, flow decreases. Resistance decreases, flow increases. Change in pressure is large, flow increases. Change in pressure is small, flow decreases. So those are the, the you know, colloquial ways of saying this formula. If you like math, you can memorize that formula and you've got all of those concepts ready to go. You can brain dump that formula somewhere on your exam paper and you're going to get those questions right. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, I don't really have much for this. Okay. If bronchi or airways become constricted or obstructed, uh, that's going to change our ventilation very, very obviously. We're also going to have sympathetic nervous system innervation specifically affecting beta-2 receptors. This seems like a really needed gritty detail. The reason it's here is that when you get to pharmacology, you're going to have alpha blockers, you're going to have beta blockers, beta-2 blockers, beta-1 blockers, and those are going to have effects on your cardiovascular and respiratory systems. So if you can start really getting down to the nitty-gritty of where those receptors are located now, it's going to make it easier in farm for you. And you want anything that's going to make it easier for farm, right? So those beta-2 receptors are located in smooth muscles of the bronchi, and those are what cause that bronchodilation, thereby increasing flow. So if we want a drug to increase the flow, we could get a beta-2 receptor agonist.
Questions about that? Again, surfactant, we already talked about this concept. Surfactant is going to maintain patency or openness of alveoli. And insufficient quantity in premature infants causes infant respiratory distress syndrome. Lung compliance is going to be very literally the amount that your lungs can move, right? Can they expand? Can they compress? Is the thoracic cage movable? Is that uh, respiratory diaphragm contractible? Um, and it's usually pretty high. And surfactant helps with lung compliance as, as well. Lung tissue is distensible. And recall, distensible means that stretching por portion, elasticity was recoiling back. Uh, as we age, we're exposed to more and more toxic things that we inhale. Unfortunately, this is relatively common. We live in the city or close enough to a big city that this is absolutely true for each and every one of us. If you're a smoker, it's even more true for you. Uh, you're going to experience some degree of fibrotic scarring in your long lifetime. And the more exposure you have to toxic things, the more fibrosis can occur. As we age also, we can stop producing quite so much surfactant. And if we develop some kind of osteoarthritis, spondylitis, something that is going to impact the mobility of the joints in the thoracic cage, that can decrease lung compliance as well. So even if somebody is developing kyphosis, which is a hunchback, that's going to decrease the amount that the thoracic cage can change shape. And that decreases lung compliance. Questions about that? All right, here's another huge one. You are going to see this chart. This is your respiratory volumes, and there are a number of different terms here. Let me see if I've got a better one of those. I think that's the best one I have right now. As you are sitting here, hopefully nobody's not in, I don't want anybody in fight or flight right now. I want us all breathing normally and happily. You are not even close to using the full capacity of your lungs. You are at tidal volume. You inhale a little bit of volume, you exhale a little bit of volume. You inhale a little bit, you exhale a little bit. In fact, you're probably only gauging less than a third of the base, or you're probably just engaging the base of your lungs in terms of where there's actually air in your lungs. So then you go to a yoga class and your yoga instructor tells you to inhale all the way and you go. And now you've used your inspiratory reserve volume. So inhaling to your maximum capacity of inhalation gets your inspiratory capacity filled. And then that same yoga teacher says, now exhale all the way and as you move from the complete inhale all the way through the complete exhale, that total between inspiratory and expiratory max was your vital capacity. If you had gone from your tidal volume and just suddenly exhaled all the way, that was your expiratory reserve volume. And note that there's still some volume in here that you cannot voluntarily exhale. That's because your alveoli are patent and open. You can never voluntarily collapse your alveoli. It is for the best. So you have a residual volume of air in your lungs even when you have exhaled completely. We have acronyms for each of these. TV, tidal volume. IRV, inspiratory reserve volume inspiratory capacity, ERV, expiratory reserve volume, RV, residual volume, VC, vital capacity. I don't care about these numbers, but I definitely want you to know all of the names of all of these different volumes. I can absolutely hold you to these, um, and this is just the first time you're seeing it. There are all kinds of gadgets that are used in pulmonary medicine to measure these, and you will absolutely utilize them. Sound good to everyone? Okay. Hmm, it's not going to let me do it. Okay. 
Okay, which one's title volume? What's title volume? What you're doing right now. Good. And what would expiratory reserve volume look like? Good. And what would inspiratory reserve volume look like? <gasps> Good. And what would vital capacity look like? Yeah, inhaling all the way, and then when you're at your maximum, exhaling all the way, and that change in volume was your vital capacity. All the way in plus all the way out. So in this case, it was a change between 6,000 milliliters of volume to... Uh, I think that's a little like 1,200 milliliters of volume was our change in vital capacity. Great. Now I mentioned, and I'm just going to repeat this a bunch of times, ventilation was inhaling and exhaling physically. Respiration was gas exchange. Now, you've got external respiration and internal respiration. We're going to further split that concept. It's gas exchange, but when we exchange gases between the air and our capillaries, so that air is the external environment. That is considered external respiration. Even though it's happening deep in your lungs, we call it external respiration. Exchanging gases with the environment. When we carry that oxygen bound to hemoglobin to all the tissues in the body, it's then going to go to your cells. It's carrying that oxygen to your cells. When that oxygen is exchanged with your cells, they give back carbon dioxide, and that is called internal respiration. It's still respiration. This is why that concept of respiration was so different in this case from ventilation, because we have internal respiration. And I'm gonna throw another way back term at you, cellular respiration. Remember that term? Do you guys remember the formula for cellular respiration? <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a curveball. It's relevant, though. So we put in glucose. Does anybody remember what else we put in? C6H12O6 plus... What do you need for cellular respiration to work? Water. Uh, water's going to be a byproduct. You don't need for it to work. <laughs> uh, it's going to produce ATP. That's the purpose. So that's going to be on the other side of the formula. You need oxygen, well done. So glucose and oxygen go out. Does anybody remember what comes out? So ATP, water, and carbon dioxide, boom. So this is cellular respiration. Internal respiration allows for cellular respiration. That's the whole reason we breathe, is so that our cells can get oxygen, complete cellular respiration, produce ATP. Byproduct of carbon dioxide is another part of that respiratory pathway that we have. Sounding good to everyone? It's all tied, it's all the same thing. It's all connected, it's the great circle of life. So internal respiration is going to be sharing uh, gases in the body tissues. So you've inhaled it in your lungs, it went to your systemic circuit, that oxygen makes it into all of your capillary beds, gas exchange happens with your cells, and that is internal respiration. So comfortable with those differences? Give me one of these. I totally get this. Cool. Yeah. Are those arrows going the wrong way in the picture on the bottom left? This is representing uh, oxygen, and this is representing carbon dioxide, and. And the carbon dioxide is going into the bloodstream. Yeah, the carbon dioxide is going from the cell into the bloodstream because that bloodstream is going to carry it back now that it's deoxygenated. Oh, okay. it's Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I have a variation on this picture that I've drawn on your worksheet for the day. Uh, we'll, we'll do a visual uh, explanation for it since I, I basically drew it in Microsoft Word and it's just some squiggles. Um, so you guys, you don't have to draw it, but we'll, we'll make sure that you understand it before you get on your worksheet today. All right, so the Environment is rich in oxygen and low in CO2. So oxygen moves down its gradient into the bloodstream in the lungs, and carbon dioxide moves down its gradient into the alveoli in the lungs. So far so good? Out in the tissues, the tissues are low in oxygen. The bloodstream is high in oxygen since it has already stopped by the lungs for oxygen. 
So oxygen diffuses into the cells and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cells. All down their concentration gradients. Give me one of these. Yes, no, yes, no. Okay. When we say concentration gradients, we're now going to use partial pressure to represent that term. Partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So the partial pressure of oxygen is high here and low here. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is low here, or sorry, high here and low here. Partial pressure of oxygen is high here and low here. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high here and low here. And this means the exact same thing of what I just said. The environment is high in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide. Partial pressure of oxygen is high. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is low. As we go throughout the system, those tissues are going to have low oxygen, high carbon dioxide. We're going to gradually lose oxygen as we lose oxygen to the tissues until we come back to the pulmonary circuit and oxygenate again. Does that make more or less sense in that graph? Same concept. You already know that oxygen is carried bound to hemoglobin. That hemoglobin is going to be in our red blood cells. So most of your oxygen will be carried bound to hemoglobin. Some of it will be carried dissolved in plasma. But we're going to focus on that hemoglobin. Here is your oxygen hemoglobin association curve. And I think um, I might talk through it once and then I actually want to go on break because this is a, a pretty big concept. This is the one that people have a hard time with on this lecture. So what we're saying is there's a certain amount of oxygen. And there's a certain amount of oxygen that is specifically bound to hemoglobin. As you increase the partial pressure of oxygen, as in you increase the amount of oxygen in general, that should increase the amount of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin. That's a pretty direct connection, right? More oxygen, more of it is bound to hemoglobin. At a certain point, all of your hemoglobin is full up of oxygen. And even if you give us more oxygen, we will not bind a lot more hemoglobin. So that's why it levels off here. So it starts being just a direct correlation, and then it levels off as we reach saturation. And that's all I want to explain on this chart so far, because it's about to get a lot more convoluted. So what is on the x-axis? Partial pressure of oxygen, which translates colloquially to what? The amount of oxygen, the amount of oxygen around. Good. And on the y-axis, what do we have? The oxygen that is bound specifically to hemoglobin. In other words, saturation of oxygen on hemoglobin. Good. And it's a direct correlation here because more oxygen means more binding. And why does it level off? Because we're reaching saturation. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop. It's a little bit of...